Chapter 10. Preliminary Expeditions As over 15,000 flash gallons had come to Teshkoko with the timber for the launches, and had already been five days in the city without doing anything worth mentioning, and as they had not brought supplies with them, food was getting scarce, and Chichimecatecla, the captain of the Flash Colin, being a very valiant and proud man, said to Cortez that he wished to go and render some service to our great emperor by fighting against the Mexicans, both to show his strength and the goodwill he bore us, as well as to avenge the deaths of his brethren and his vassals, and he begged as a favor from Cortez that he would command and instruct him in what direction he should go and encounter our enemies. Cortez replied to him that he thought very highly of his goodwill, and said that he wished to go himself the next day to a pueblo named Saltocan, five or six leagues distant from the city of Texcoco, where, although the horse houses were built in the waters of a lake, there was an entrance from the land. He had sent three times to summon the people of that pueblo to make peace, and they refused to do so, but ill-treated the messengers and wounded two of them, and sent as an answer that if we came there, we would find forces in a fortress as strong as Mexico, and come when we might, we would find them on the field of battle, for they had received word from their idols that they would kill us there, and their idols had advised them to send this reply. Cortez got ready to go in person on this expedition, and ordered 250 soldiers to go in his company with 30 horsemen, and he took with him Pedro de Alvarado and Cristobal de Olid, and many musketeers and crossbowmen, and all the Tlaxcalans, and a company of warriors from Texcoco, nearly all of them chieftains. He left Gonzalo de Sandoval on guard at Texcoco, and told him to keep a good lookout, both on the Texcocans and the launches in the camp, and see that no attack was made on it by night, for, as I've already said, we had always to keep on the alert, on the one hand to guard against the Mexicans themselves, and on the other, because we were in such a great city as was Texcoco, where all the inhabitants of the city were relations and friends of the Mexicans. He also ordered Sandoval and Martin Lopez to have the vessels ready to be launched and to sail within fifteen days. Then, after hearing mass, Cortez set out with his army, and not far from Saltocan he met great squadrons of Mexicans who were awaiting him in a place where they believed that they could get the better of our Spaniards and kill the horses. Cortez ordered the horsemen, as soon as the muskets and crossbowmen had been discharged, to break in upon the enemy. However, they killed only a few of the Mexicans, who at once took refuge in the bush and in places where the horsemen could not follow them, but our friends the Tlaxcalans captured and killed about thirty of them. That night Cortez went to sleep at some huts, and kept a good lookout, for they were in a thickly peopled country, and he knew that Guatemoc had sent many squadrons of warriors to Saltacan as reinforcements, and these troops had come in canoes along some deep creeks. Early the next morning, the Mexicans and the people of Saltocan began to attack our troops, and they shot many darts and arrows at them, and slung stones from their slings from the canals where they were posted, and they wounded ten of our soldiers and many of our Tlaxcalan allies. And our horsemen could do them no hurt, for they could not gallop nor cross the creeks. The causeway and road by which they were used to enter the town from the land had been destroyed, and broken down by hand only a few days before. Owing to this, our soldiers found no way by which they could enter the town or do any damage to its defenders, although they kept up a fire against those who went about in canoes. But the canoes were protected by bulwarks of wood, and besides, they took good care not to expose themselves. Our soldiers, seeing that they could gain no advantage whatever, and that they could not hit on the road in the causeway which was there before, because it was all covered with water, cursed the town and our profitless expedition, and were half ashamed because the Mexicans and townspeople shouted at them and called them women, and said that Malinche was a woman too, and that his only bravery was in deceiving them with stories and lies. Just at this moment, two of the Indians who had come there with our people, who belonged to the pueblo Tepetzacuco, and were very hostile to the people of Saltocan, said to one of our soldiers that three days before they had seen the people of Saltocan breaking open the causeway, and they made a ditch across it and turned the water of another canal into it. But then not very far ahead the road began again and led to the town. When our soldiers thoroughly understood this, the musketeers and crossbowmen were ranged in good order, and little by little and not altogether, sometimes skipping along and at other times wading waist-deep, all our soldiers crossed over, with many of our allies following them, Cortez and the horsemen, turning their backs on our soldiers, kept guard on the land, for they feared that the Mexican squadrons might again fall in our rear. 
When our men had passed the canals, the enemy fell on them with fury and wounded many of them, but as they had made up their minds to gain the causeway which was close by, they still forged ahead until they could attack the enemy on land, clear of the water, and then they got to the town. Without further waste of words, they fell on the enemy so fiercely that they killed many of them, and repaid them well for the trick they had played. Much cotton cloth and gold and other spoil was taken, but as the town was built in the lake, the Mexicans and the inhabitants soon got into their canoes with all the property they were able to carry, and went off to Mexico. When our people saw the town deserted, they burned some of the houses, and as they did not dare to sleep there because the town stood in the water, they returned to where Captain Cortez was awaiting them. The next day they marched to the great pueblo named Guautitlan, and as they went on their way, the Indians from the neighboring villages and many Mexicans who had joined them yelled and whistled and shouted insults at our men, but they kept to the canals and the places where the horsemen could not gallop and no harm could be done to them. In this way our troops arrived at the town, which had been abandoned that same day, and all the property carried off. That night they slept there, well guarded by sentinels and patrols, and the following day marched on to the great pueblo called Tenayuca. They found this pueblo deserted like the last, and all the Indian inhabitants had assembled together in another town further on called Tacuba. From Tenayuca they marched to Azcapotzalco, about half a league distant from one of the others, and this too was deserted. And this town of Azcapotzalco was where they used to work the gold and silver for the great Montezuma. From here they marched to Tacuba, a distance of half a league, and this is the place where we halted on that sad night when we came out from Mexico routed. Before our army could reach the town, it was met in the open by a large number of troops which were lying in wait, gathered from all the pueblos through which our army had passed, as well as those from Tacuba and Mexico, for Mexico was close by. All of them together began an attack on our people in such a manner that our captain and the horsemen had all they could do to break through their ranks, so close did they keep together. However, our soldiers, with good sword play, forced them to retreat. Then, as it was nighttime, they went to sleep in the town after posting sentinels and watchmen. If there had been many Mexicans gathered together that day, there were many more on the next morning, and in excellent order they advanced to attack our people with such energy that they killed and wounded some of our soldiers. Nevertheless, our men forced them to retreat to their houses and fortresses so that they found time to enter Tacuba and burn and sack many of the houses. When this was known in Mexico, many more squadrons were ordered to go forth from the city to fight against Cortez, and it was arranged that when they fought with him, they should pretend to turn and fly towards Mexico, and little by little they should draw our army onto the causeway until they had them well on to it, and that they should behave as though they were retreating out of fear. As it was arranged, so they carried it out, and Cortez, believing that he was gaining a victory, ordered the enemy to be followed as far as a bridge. When the Mexicans thought that they had already got Cortez in their trap, and the bridge had been crossed, a huge multitude of Indians turned on him, some in canoes and others by land, and others on the Azoteas, and they placed him in such straits and matters looked so serious that he believed himself to be defeated, for at the bridge that he had reached they fell on him with such force that he could effect little or nothing. A standard-bearer, in resisting the charge of the enemy, was badly wounded and fell with his banner from the bridge into the water, and was in danger of being drowned, and the Mexicans had even seized him to drag him into a canoe, but he was so strong that he escaped with his banner. In that fight they killed four or five of our soldiers and wounded many of them, and Cortez, recognizing the great audacity and want of forethought that he had shown in going onto the causeway in the way I have related, and feeling the Mexicans had caught him in a trap, ordered all his followers to retire in the best order possible without turning their backs, but with their faces towards the enemy and hand to hand, as though resisting an onset. The horsemen made some charges, but they were very few, for the horses were soon wounded. In this way, Cortez escaped that time from the power of the Mexicans, and when he got on dry land, he gave great thanks to God. During the five days that Cortez stayed in Tacuba, he had encounters and battles with Mexicans, and he then returned to Texcoco along the road by which he had come. By long marches, Cortez arrived at a pueblo subject to Texcoco named Aculman, about two leagues and a half distant from Texcoco, and as soon as we knew that he had arrived there, we went out with Gonzalo de Sandoval to see him and receive him, accompanied by the caciques of Texcoco. We were greatly delighted at the sight of Cortez, for we had known nothing of what had happened to him for fifteen days, 
After welcoming him, we returned to Teshkoko that afternoon, for we did not dare to leave the camp without a sufficient guard. The Tlashkalans, as they were now rich and came laden with spoil, asked leave to return to their homes, and Cortez granted it, and they went by a road where the Mahicans could not spy on them and save their property. At the end of four days, during which our captain was resting and hurrying on the building of the launches, the people from some pueblos on the north coast came to ask for peace and offer themselves as vassals to his majesty. At this same time, there came messengers from other pueblos who had become our friends, saying that we must come and help them because great squadrons of Mexicans were coming against them and had entered their territory and were carrying off many of their Indians as prisoners and had wounded others. There also came people from Chalco and Tlamanalco, who said that if we did not come to their assistance, they would all be lost and told a most pitiful tale and brought a piece of henequen cloth painted with an exact representation of the squadrons of Mexicans which had come against them. Cortez did not know what to say, nor how to answer them or help them, for he had seen that many of our soldiers were wounded and ill, and eight had died of pains in the back, and from throwing up clotted blood mixed with mud from the mouth and nose, and it was from the fatigue of always wearing armor on our backs, and from the everlasting going on expeditions, and from the dust that we swallowed. In addition to this, three or four horses had died of their wounds, yet we never stopped going on expeditions. So the answer he gave to the first Pueblos was to flatter them, and to say that he would soon come to help them, but that while he was on the way they should get help from their neighbors. He said so much to them through our interpreters that he encouraged to put heart into them. As Cortez had ordered them, they awaited the Mexicans in the open and fought a battle with them, and with the help of our allies, their neighbors, they did not do badly. Let us return to the people of Chalco, as our Cortez saw how important it was for us that this province and the road through it should be freed from Mexicans, for it was the way we had come to go to Villarica de la Veracruz and to Tlaxcala, and we had to supply our camp from that province, for it was a land that produced much maize. He at once ordered Gonzalo de Sandoval to get ready to start the next morning for Chalco, and he ordered him to take twenty horsemen and two hundred soldiers, twelve crossbowmen and ten musketeers, and the Tlaxcalans who were in camp. There were very few, for the greater number of them had gone to their homes laden with spoil, and Sandoval also took with him a company of Texcocans, and Captain Luis Marin, who was his intimate friend, Cortez and Pedro de Alvarado and Cristobal de Olid remained behind to guard the city and the law. After hearing Mass, Sandoval set out on 12th March in the year 1521 and slept at some farms belonging to Chalco, and on the next morning arrived at Tlamanalco, where the caciques and captains gave him a good reception and provided food, and advised him to go at once in the direction of a great pueblo called Huatepec, where he would find the whole of the Mexican forces either assembled at Huatepec or on the road thither, and they said that all the warriors from the province of Chalco Sandoval set out at once, and went on to sleep at a Pueblo subject of Chalco called Chimalhuacan. For the spies sent by the people of Chalco to watch the Kuluas came to report that the enemy forces were lying in wait for them in some rocky defiles in the neighborhood of that town. As the enemy was posted in broken ground, and it was not known if they had dug pits or raised barricades, Sandoval wished to keep his soldiers well in hand so as to avoid any disaster. As he continued his march, he saw the Mahican squadrons approaching him in three divisions, shouting and whistling and sounding trumpets and drums, and they came on to the attack like fierce lions. Sandoval told the horsemen to charge them at once before they could reach our men, cheering on his troops by shouting, Santiago, and at them! Sandoval led the charge himself, and by that movement he routed some of the Mahican squadrons, but not all of them, so that they soon turned and showed a firm front, for they were helped by the bad track and broken ground, and the horsemen, owing to the rough ground, were not able to gallop and could not get in rear of them. To finish my story, the Mahicans were forced into retreat, but their flight was towards other bad passes. Sandoval and the horsemen went in pursuit, but overtook only three or four of the enemy. During that pursuit, owing to the badness of the road, the horse of a cavalryman named Gonzalo Dominguez fell with his rider beneath him, and the man died from his injuries within a few days. I call this to mind because Gonzalo Dominguez was one of the best horsemen and was one of the most valiant men that Cortez had brought in his company, and we held him in much esteem for his valor, for we all felt the loss greatly. To go back to Sandoval and his army, they followed the enemy to the neighborhood of the Pueblo of Waterbeck, 
but before reaching the town, over 15,000 Mexicans emerged from it and began to surround our soldiers and wounded many of them by horses. But as the ground was level in some places, our horsemen, making a united effort, broke up two of their squadrons, and the rest turned tail and fled towards the town in order to guard some barricades which they had raised. But our soldiers and the allies followed so close that they had no time to defend them, and the horsemen kept up the pursuit in other directions until they had shut the enemy up in a part of the town where they could not be reached. Thinking the enemy would not again renew the attack on that day, Sandoval ordered his men to rest and tend their wounds, and they began to take their food. While they were eating, two horsemen and two soldiers who had been told off as scouts before the men began to eat ran in crying, To arms! To arms! The Mexicans are coming in great force! As they were always accustomed to have their arms in readiness, the horsemen were soon mounted and they came out into a great plaza. At that moment the enemy were upon them, and there they fought another good battle. After the enemy had been for some time showing us a good front from some barricades and wounding some of our men, Sandoval fell on them so suddenly with his horsemen that with the help of the muskets and crossbows and the swordplay of the soldiers, he drove them from the town into some neighboring barrancas, and they did not come back again that day. When Captain Sandoval found himself free from that struggle, he gave thanks to God and went to rest and sleep in an orchard within the town, which was so beautiful and contained such fine buildings that it was the best worth beholding of anything we had seen in New Spain. There were so many things in it to look at that it was really wonderful, and was certainly the orchard of a great prince, and we could not go all through it then, but it was more than a quarter of a league in length. Let us stop talking about the orchard and say that I did not go myself on this expedition, nor did I then walk about this orchard. But I went there about twenty days later when, in company with Cortez, we made the round of the great towns of the lakes, as I shall tell later on. The reason why I did not go this first time was because I had been badly wounded by a spear thrust in the throat and was in danger of dying from it, and I still bear the scar. The wound was given me during the Itzapalapa affair when they tried to drown us. On the following day, Gonzalo de Sandoval sent messengers to treat for peace, but the caciques did not dare to come in for fear of the Mexicans. The same day, Sandoval sent to another large pueblo called Yecapixla, about two leagues distant from Huatepec, to tell the people to take warning from what had happened to the squadrons of Culua stationed in the pueblo of Huatepec and to make peace and expel the Mexican garrisons who were guarding their country, and that if they did not do so, he would come and make war on them and chastise them. The answer returned was that the Spaniards might come when they liked, for they were looking forward to feast on their flesh and provide sacrifices for their idols. When this reply was given, the caciques from Chalco, who were with Sandoval, knew that there must be a large force of Mexicans in garrison at Yecapixla, ready to make war on Chalco as soon as Sandoval should retire, and for this reason they begged him to go to Yacapishla and drive the Mexicans out of the place. However, Sandoval was not willing to go, one reason being that many of his soldiers and horses were wounded, and the other that he had already fought three battles, and he did not wish to exceed the instructions that Cortes had given him. Moreover, some of the gentlemen whom he had brought in his company, men from the army of Narve, advised him to return to Texcoco and not go to Yacapishla, which was strongly fortified, lest some disaster should befall him. However, the captain, Luis Marin, counseled him not to fail to go to that fortress and do what he could, for the caciques from Chalco said that if he turned back without defeating the force which was assembled in that fortress, that as soon as they saw or heard that he had returned to Texcoco, the enemy would at once attack Chalco. Sandoval, therefore, decided to go to Yacapixla. As soon as he came in sight of the town, a host of warriors came out and began to shoot darts and arrows and cast stones from their slings, so they fell like hail, and three horses and many soldiers were wounded without our men being able to do any harm to the enemy. As Sandoval observed that the caciques from Chalco and their captains and many of the Indian warriors were maneuvering round about without daring to attack the enemy, on purpose to try them and to see what they were would answer, Sandoval said to them, what are you doing? Why don't you begin to fight and get into the town and fortress, for we are here and will defend you? They replied that they did not dare to do it, that the enemy were in a stronghold, and it was for this very purpose that Sandoval and his brother Tools had come with them, and that the people of Chalco had come under his protection, relying on his help to drive the enemy out. 
So Sandoval and all his soldiers began the attack, and many were wounded as they clambered up the sides of the ravines, and Sandoval himself was again wounded in the head, and many of our allies were wounded, for they too entered the town and did much damage to it. And it was the Indians from Chalco and our allies from Tlaxcala who did most damage to the enemy, for our soldiers, after breaking up their ranks and putting them to flight, would not give a sword thrust at the enemy, for it seemed to them mere cruelty, and they were chiefly occupied in looking out for petty Indian women and seeking plunder, and they frequently quarreled with our allies on account of their cruelty and took the Indian men and women away from them to prevent their being killed. I must go on to say that when this was over, Sandoval and all his army returned to Tishkoka with much spoil, especially of good-looking Indian women. When the Lord of Mexico, who was called Watamok, heard of the defeat of his armies, it is said that he showed much resentment at it, and still more at the thought that the people of Chalco, who were his subjects and vassals, should dare to take up arms three times against his forces. He was so angry that he resolved that as soon as Sandoval should return to his camp at Teshkoko, he would send out a great force of warriors, which he had once assembled in the city of Mako, and another force which was got together from the lake, equipped with every sort of arms, and would dispatch this force, numbering over 20,000 Mexicans, in 2,000 large canoes, to make a sudden descent on Chalco, to do all the damage that it was possible to do. This was all accomplished with such skill and rapidity that Sandoval had hardly arrived at Teshkoko and spoken to Cortez, when again messengers came in canoes across the lake begging help from Cortez, telling him that more than 2,000 canoes carrying over 20,000 Mexicans had come to Chalco, and they begged him to come at once to their assistance. At the very moment that Cortez heard this news, Sandoval came to speak to him and to give him an account of what he had done during the expedition from which he had just then returned. But Cortez was so angry with him he would not listen to him, believing that it was through some fault or carelessness on his part that our friends at Chalco were experiencing this trouble. And without any delay, and without listening to him, Cortez ordered Sandoval to leave all his wounded men in camp and to go back again in all haste with those who were sound. Sandoval was much distressed at the words Cortez used to him, and at his refusal to listen to him. But he set out at once for Chalco, where his men arrived tired out with the weight of their arms and their long march. It appears that the people of Chalco learning through their spies that the Mexicans were coming so suddenly upon them, and that Guatemoc had determined that they should be attacked before any help could reach them from us, had sent to summon aid from the people of the province of Huesotzingo, which was nearby, and men from Huesotzingo arrived that same night, all equipped with their arms, and joined with those from Chalco, so that in all there were more than twenty thousand of them. As they had already lost their fear of the Mexicans, they quietly awaited their arrival in camp, and fought like brave men, and although the Mexicans killed many of them and took many prisoners, the people of Chalco killed many more of the Mexicans and took as prisoners fifteen captains and chieftains and other warriors of lesser rank. The Mexicans looked upon this battle as a much greater disgrace, seeing that the people of Chalco had defeated them than if they had been defeated by us. When Sandoval arrived at Chalco and found that there was nothing for him to do and nothing more to be feared as the Mexicans would not return again to Chalco, he marched back again to Texcoco and took the Mexican prisoners with him. Whereat Cortez was delighted, but Sandoval showed great resentment towards our captain for what had happened and did not go to see or speak to him until Cortez sent to tell him that he had misunderstood the affair, thinking that it was through some carelessness on his part that things had gone wrong that although he had set out with a large force of soldiers and horsemen, he had returned without defeating the Mexicans. I will cease speaking about this matter now, for Cortez and Sandoval soon became fast friends again, and there was nothing Cortez would not do to please Sandoval. As Gonzalo de Sandoval had arrived in Texcoco with a great booty of slaves, and there were many others which had captured in the late expeditions, it was decided that they should at once be branded, when proclamation was made, most of us soldiers took those slaves that we possessed to be marked with the brand of his majesty in the way that we had already arranged with Cortez. We thought that our slaves would be returned to us after the royal fifth had been paid, and that a price would be put on the women's slaves in accordance with the value of each one of them. However, it was not to be done, and if the affair was badly managed at Tepeaca, it was managed much worse here at Texcoco. From this time on, many of us soldiers would be captured good-looking Indian women hid them away and did not take them to be branded, but gave out that they had escaped. Or if we were favorites of Cortez, we took them secretly by night to be branded, and they were valued at their worth, the royal fifth paid, 
and they were marked with the iron. Many others remained in our lodgings, and we said that they were free servants from the Pueblos that had made peace, or from Tlaxcala. About this time, a ship arrived from Spain, in which came Julian de Alderete, his majesty's treasurer. A great store of arms and powder was also brought in this ship. In fact, as was to be expected in a ship coming from Spain, it came well laden, and we rejoiced at its arrival and at the news from Spain that it brought. Cortez now saw that the building of the launches was finished, and noted the eagerness of all of us soldiers to commence the siege of Mexico. As Cortez had told the people of Chalco that he was coming to help them so that the Mexicans should no longer come and attack them, who had been going there and back every week to assist them, he ordered a force of soldiers to be prepared, and they were 300 soldiers, 30 horsemen, 20 crossbowmen, and 15 musketeers, and the treasurer Julian de Alvarete, Pedro de Alvarado, Andre de Tapia, Cristobal de Olid, and the friar Pedro Melgarejo went also, and Cortez ordered me to go with them, and there were many Tlaxcalans and allies from Texcoco in his company. He left Gonzalo de Sandoval behind with a good company of soldiers and horsemen to guard Texcoco and the launches. On the morning of Friday the 5th, April 1521, after hearing Mass, we set out for Tlalnauco, where we were well received, and we slept there. The next day we went to Chalco, for the one town is quite close to the other, and there, were, and there Cortez ordered all the caciques of the province to be called together, and he made them a speech in which he gave them to understand that we were now going to try whether we could bring to peace some of the towns in the neighborhood of the lake, and also to view the land and position before blockading Mexico and that we were going to place 13 launches on the lake, and he begged them to be ready to accompany us on the next day with all the warriors. When they understood this, all with one voice promised that they would willingly do what we asked. The next day we went to sleep at Chimaluacan, and there we met more than 20,000 allies from Chalco, Texcoco, and Huishotzingo, and from Tlaxcala and other towns, and in all the expeditions in which I had been engaged in New Spain, Never have I known so many of our allied warriors to accompany us as joined us now. About this time we received news that in a plain nearby there were many companies and squadrons of Mexicans, and all their allies from the country round about waiting to attack us. So Cortez held us in readiness, and after hearing mass we set out early in the morning from the Pueblo of Chimaluacan, and marched along some high rocks between two hills where there were fortifications and barricades, where many Indians, both men and women, were safely sheltered, and from these strongholds they yelled and shouted at us, but we did not care to attack them, and kept quietly on our way, and arrived at a plain where there were some springs with very little water. On one side was a high rocky hill with a fortress very difficult to subdue, as the attempt soon proved, and we saw that it was crowded with warriors, and from the summit they shouted at us and threw stones and shot darts and arrows, and wounded three of our soldiers. Then Cortez ordered us to halt there and said, It seems that all these Mexicans who shut themselves up in fortresses make mock of us as long as we do not attack them. And he ordered some horsemen and crossbowmen to go round to the other side of the hill and see if there was a more convenient opening whence to attack them. They returned to say that the best approach was where we were, for there was no other place where it was possible to climb up, for it was all steep rock. Then Cortez ordered us to make an attack. The standard bearer Cristobal del Coral led the way with other ensigns, and all of us followed him while Cortez and the horsemen kept guard in the plain, so that no other troops of Mexicans should fall on the baggage or on us during our attack on the stronghold. As we began to climb up the hill, the Indians who were posted above rolled down so many huge stones and rocks that it was terrifying to see them hurtling and bounding down, and it was a miracle that we were not all of us killed. One soldier named Martinez fell dead at my feet, he had a helmet on his head, but he gave no cry, and never spoke another word. Still we kept on, but as the great Galgas, as we call these big rocks in this country, came rolling and tearing and bounding down and breaking in pieces, they soon killed two more good soldiers, Gaspar Sanchez, nephew of the treasurer of Cuba, and a man named Bravo, but still we kept on. Then another valiant soldier named Alonso Rodriguez was killed, and two others were wounded in the head and nearly all the rest were wounded in the legs, and still we persevered and pushed on ahead. As I was active in those days, I kept on following the standard-bearer corral, and we got beneath some hollows and cavities, which were 
there in the hillside so as to avoid a chance rock hitting us, and I clambered up from hollow to hollow to escape being killed. The standard bearer Cristobal del Corral sheltered himself behind some thick trees covered with thorns which grow in these hollows. His face was streaming with blood, and his banner was broken, and he called out, O oh, Senor Bernardias del Castillo, it is impossible to go on any further. Keep in the shelter of the hollow, and take care that none of those galgas or boulders strike you, for one can hardly hold on with one's hands and feet, much less climb any higher. Just then I saw that Pedro Barba, a captain of the crossbowmen, and two other soldiers were coming up in the same way that Corral and I had done, climbing from hollow to hollow. I called out from above, Senor Capitan, don't come up any further, for you can't hold on with hands and feet, but will roll down again. When I said this to him, he replied as though he were very valiant or some great lord and could make no other reply. Go ahead. I took that reply as a personal insult and answered him. Let us see you come to where I am. And I went up still higher. At that very moment, such a great lot of great stones came rolling down on us from above where they had stored them for the purpose that Pedro Barba was wounded and one soldier killed, and they could not climb a single step higher. Then the standard-bearer Corral cried out that they should pass the word to Cortez from mouth to mouth, that we could not get any higher, and that to retreat was equally dangerous. When Cortez heard this, he understood what was happening, for there below, where he stood on the level ground, two or three soldiers had been killed, and seven of them wounded by the great impetus of the boulders which were hurled down on them, and Cortez thought for certain that nearly all of us who had made the ascent must have been killed or badly wounded, for from where he stood he could not see the folds in the hill. So by signs and shouts, and by the shots that they fired, we went up, up above, knew that they were meant as signals for us to retreat, and in good order we descended from hollow to hollow, our bodies bruised and streaming with blood, the banners rent and eight men dead. When Cortez saw us, he gave thanks to God, and they related to him what had happened between Pedro Barba and me. Pedro Barba himself and the standard bearer Corral were telling him about the great strength of the hill, and that it was a marvel that the boulders did not carry us away as they flew down, and the story was soon known throughout the camp. Let us leave these empty tales, and say how there were many companies of Mexicans lying in wait in places where we could neither see nor observe them, hoping to bring help and succor to those posted on the hill, for they well knew that we should not be able to force our way to the stronghold and they had arranged while we were fighting to attack us in the rear. When Cortez knew that they were approaching, he ordered the horsemen and all of us to go and attack them, and this we did, for the ground was level in places, as there were fields lying between the small hills, and we pursued the enemy until they reached another very strong hill. We killed very few Indians during the pursuit, for they took refuge in places where we could not reach them. So we returned to the stronghold which we had attempted to scale, and seeing that there was no water there, and that neither we nor the horses had had anything to drink that day, for the springs which I have spoken about as being there contained nothing but mud, because the many allies whom we had brought with us crowded into them and would not let them flow. For this reason, orders were given to shift our camp, and we went down through some fields to another hill, which was distant from the first about a league and a half, thinking that we should find water there. But we found very little of it, Near this hill were some native mulberry trees, and there we camped, and there were some twelve or thirteen houses at the foot of the stronghold. As soon as we arrived, the Indians began to shout and shoot darts and arrows and roll down boulders from above. And there were many more people in this fortress than there were in the first hill, and it was much stronger, as we afterwards found out. Our musketeers and crossbowmen fired up at them, but they were so high up and protected by so many barricades that we could not do them any harm. Besides, there was no possibility of climbing up and forcing our way in. Although we made two attempts from the houses that stood there over some steps by which we could mount up for two stages, beyond that it was worse than the first hill, for we did not increase our reputation at this stronghold any more than at the first, and the victory lay with the Mexicans and their allies. That night we slept in the Mulberry Grove and were half dead with thirst. It was arranged that on the next day all the musketeers and crosswomen should go to another hill which was close by the large one and should climb up it. For there was a way up, although it was not an easy one, to see if from that hill their muskets and crossbows would carry as far as the stronghold to the other, so that they could attack it. Cortez ordered Francisco Verdugo and the treasurer Juan de Aldorete, who boasted that they were both good crosswomen, and Pedro Barba, who was a captain, to go as leaders, 
and all the rest of the soldiers to attack from the steps and tracks above the houses, which I have already spoken of, and to climb up as best we could. So we began the ascent, but they hurled down so many stones, both great and small, that many of the soldiers were wounded, and in addition to this, it was quite useless to attempt the ascent, for even using both our hands and feet, we could climb no further. While we were making these attempts, the musketeers and crossbowmen from the other hill of which I have spoken managed to reach the enemy with their muskets and crossbows, but they could only just do it. However, they killed some and wounded others. In this way, we went on attacking them for about half an hour, when it pleased our Lord God that they agreed to make peace. The reason why they did so was that they had not got a drop of water, and there was a great number of people on the level ground on the hilltop. And the people from all the neighborhood round had taken refuge there, both men, women, and children, and slaves, that we down below should understand that they wished for peace. The women on the hill waved their shawls and clapped their palms with their hands together as a sign that they would make bread or tortillas for us, and the warriors ceased shooting arrows and darts and hurtling down stones. When Cortez observed this, he ordered that no more harm should be done to them, and by signs he made them understand that five of their chiefs should come down to treat for peace. When they came down with much reverence, they asked Cortez to pardon them for having protected and defended themselves by taking refuge in that stronghold. Cortez replied somewhat angrily that they deserved death for having begun the war, but as they had come to make peace, they must go at once to the other hill and summon the caciques and chiefs who were stationed there and bring in the dead bodies, and that if they came in peace, he would pardon what had happened. If not, that we should attack them and besiege them until they died of thirst, for we knew well that they too had no water. There is very little in all that part of the country. So they went off at once to summon the caciques, as they were told to do.